Welcome to the Serial Killer Podcast, the podcast dedicated to serial killers, who they were, what they did, and how. I am your host, Thomas Weiborg Thune, and before we start the tale of tonight's subject, I need to do some house cleaning. Recently, more and more of my dear listeners have been leaving reviews of this show, and I really do appreciate it. I value all feedback. And one of the things several reviewers are writing is that they are not able to place my accent. So, in order to clear that up, I am not a native English speaker, and I do not live in either the UK or the United States of America. I am a Norwegian, living in Norway. Also, this show reached a very important milestone as we moved from March into April. As you, dear listener, are downloading this episode, you are one of over one million people to do so. This show has grown from just a few hundred downloads back in July 2016 to over 300,000 monthly downloads in March of 2017. This makes me very proud and immensely happy that so many people like my tales of serial murder. This episode, like most other episodes, is advertisement-free, but it is not free to produce. So, if you like this show and want to ensure its continued existence, please check out my Patreon page at patreon.com slash the serial killer podcast. Any donation, no matter how small, is greatly appreciated. And with that out of the way... On with the show. So join me as we once more travel to the United States, but not the Midwest, and not the Eastern Seaboard. We go west, the Southwest, and the great state of New Mexico. Even though we are, luckily, no longer living in the golden era of serial murder, there are still many serial killers active, and every year I read about new killers being caught. One of the more contemporary killers was caught as late as 1999, and for some odd reason his story is largely untold. He hunted, tortured, and killed young women for a longer period than any other killer I know of. He probably started raping, torturing, and killing in the 1960s and didn't stop until his capture in March of 1999. His name was David Parker Ray and he was given only one nickname, the Toy Box Killer. He terrorized women all over the American Southwest in the course of those decades and it is likely he murdered as many as 60 women. David Parker Ray was born on the 6th of November, 1939, in Balen, New Mexico. David did, as many other serial killers, not have a happy childhood. He didn't grow up with his parents, but his grandfather. The few moments he spent with his father were spent being physically abused. As a child, and in his adolescence, he struggled with severe acne, and an awkward demeanor, especially around girls. Fully grown, he stood six foot two, with a wiry body and pockmarked face. Despite this, he was considered a handsome youth, but his mannerisms still caused him to be relentlessly bullied and isolated by his peers. For my loyal listeners, this will probably sound like a repetition so many serial killers were bullied in their youth, and I find it truly abhorrent that youth today experience just as much bullying and isolation as a few decades ago, when a child is exposed for years on end to such hatred, humiliation and isolation. It can often ruin their minds perhaps even releasing otherwise dormant psychopathic personality traits. Judging from David Parker Ray's actions, 
many of which he proudly confessed to, he didn't just have some psychopathic traits, he was a genuine, true sexual psychopath. David never got any higher education and graduated from Mountain Air High School in 1957 with mostly D's or F's. He couldn't find any listing of David's IQ. He probably never got officially tested. But judging from his poor grades and dropping out at grade 12 for them to continue on as a less than successful mechanic, it is safe to say David Parker Ray was not a very intelligent man, especially not compared to serial killers such as Ted Bundy, Edmund Kemper, or the certified genius Carol Edward Cole. After barely graduating high school, David joined the U.S. Army and was shipped overseas to Korea and served as an army mechanic and repairman. In the army, he also learned what he thought of as his most valuable skill. How to hurt other people. David had been very shy around girls in his youth, but his stay in the army seems to have largely cured him of that. After he came home to the United States in 1963, he quickly got married. Not once, not twice three times, all before he was thirty years old. The first marriage ended after only one year, and the second after only three months. His marriages produced three children, one daughter and two boys, one of whom he named David Ray after himself. Later, when David Ray Sr. was in prison, he was asked about his relationship with his son, to which he chuckled and said, and I quote, My son and I don't have much in common. He's a fundamentalist Christian, and he doesn't like to, um, party. End quote. The younger son he named Ron, and according to him, David Parker Ray never mistreated his children and was, according to him, a pretty mellow dad. In this regard, David Parker Ray also joins the ranks of several of his serial killer colleagues. The notorious Iceman was a devoted family man who loved his children and never laid a hand on them. The BTK killer, previously covered on this very podcast, was viewed as a pillar of his community, and his daughter still visits him regularly in prison, claiming she loves him as her father. And of course, we cannot forget the killer clown, John Wayne Gacy, who fathered two children whom he doted on and never physically mistreated. I mention these personality traits as a common misconception of serial killers and sexual psychopaths is that they are inhuman, empathyless, killing machines, incapable of love or normal interpersonal relationships. But, as Ray was one of several examples of, such people are more than capable of living double lives. One life where family, children and community matters than the other. Dark side of the mirror. Where sadism and murder is the name of the game. In the early 1970s, David took his family to Texas before moving to Oklahoma in 1975 for two years before moving again. A pattern was beginning to emerge. He never stayed long in one place and will probably never know if this was due to him moving away from the various crime scenes or if he simply always was on the lookout for the next best thing. Most of his jobs had a temporary nature and involved a lot of traveling. This allowed him freedom from his family and freedom to hunt. In 1989, he finally settled near Elephant Butte Lake, working as a truck mechanic 
which allow them opportunity to scout for victims down at Pancho Villa State Park, near the border with Mexico. Here he felt safe and comfortable, the arid, dry and warm landscape fitting his needs much the same way it fits the local rattlesnakes. And so it was. As we speed forward to the chilly afternoon of the 22nd of March, 1999, Cindy Vigil, 22 years old, was running down the narrow hall and out of the door of the mobile home in the desert, fleeing for her life. It was late, and she had no idea where she was, that she was, in fact, running down Bass Road in Elephant Butte, New Mexico. She just knew she had to get away from the two people who had kidnapped and tortured her for the last three horrible nights and days. She was naked from head to toe, wearing only a padlocked metal collar around her neck, attached to a four-foot swinging chain dangling in the wind over her shoulder. As is unfortunately more and more the norm in modern society, no one seemed to care to help the young woman. She was spotted by several inhabitants in the hot springs area, but no one offered their assistance. Cindy got lucky, however, and ran to the door of the elderly Darlene and Donald Breach, who had worked and lived in Elephant Butte for almost twenty-three years. Cindy barged through the front door and started yelling for help. She grabbed Darlene and screamed for them to not let them get her. She was quite a sight, apparently, and I quote from the interview with the breech couple. Her wrists looked like hamburger meat. She had beautiful long brown hair, and it was all matted with blood. She was dirty all over, and it looked like she had pooped her pants. Her poor little boobs were black and blue, and there were bruises all over her arms and legs. End quote. Cindy told her story of how she had grabbed her one chance for life and liberty when David Parker Ray had left the morning of the third day of her captivity, leaving his lover handy to watch over his captive. Cindy managed to get a key and unlock herself, but the woman had caught her and yelled, Hey, bitch, you're not going anywhere, and hit Cindy over the head with a big glass lamp. Cindy, however, managed to grab an ice pick and stabbed Hendy in the neck before jumping out the window and running to freedom. The breaches soon called the authorities, and they found out that a patrol car had picked up Ray and Hendy, driving around less than one block away from where the breaches lived. The David Parker Ray case soon became national news, as reports of his mobile home with an attached genuine torture chamber came to light. Bail was set to a million dollars in cash, which neither David nor his lover Handy was even close to afford. But what first appeared to be a case of a single kidnapping and a custom-made S&M chamber soon showed itself for the true horror it really was, as investigators started digging around the Ray property. They found snuff videotapes, audio tapes with David Parker Ray's voice taunting and scaring his victims, the torture chamber filled with instruments straight from a horror movie, and the police knew they had a serial offender on their hand. Angelique Montano, a pockmarked and somewhat haggard-looking 27-year-old woman, was living a hard life. She had moved from the big city to Truth or Consequences, New Mexico, in order to get her life back on track after nearly dying from methamphetamine abuse. She had a small five-year-old son, Abel, to take care of, 
and she was living off of welfare and her boyfriend, Frank Zambrano. The following is her tale, first told in full to the Globe newspaper. The horror began the day. I decided to bake a cake for my boyfriend, Frank Zambrano, who lives with me and my boy, Abel. I knew Cindy vaguely through a friend, and she had offered to give me a cake mix packet and uh, ingredients for frosting. I went with her to a white and brown recreational vehicle. David, whom I'd never met, was hiding inside. He put a knife to my throat and said I was being abducted. They drove to their home, a trailer with a small trailer parked nearby, at Elephant Butte. They sat me on a bed, and Cindy told me to just relax, and everything would be all right. David left the room and came back with a big knife. I pleaded with him, saying I wanted to go home and that my little boy Abel needed me. He slapped me viciously. The blow sent shivers of terror through my whole body. I realized this was not just some weird game, and my life was in serious danger. I am legally blind from a previous injury, but I could see the knife at my throat and Cindy pointing a pistol at me. David ripped my clothes off. They bound me naked to the bed with chains around my ankles. They also padlocked a metal collar around my neck and told me the following. Welcome to your worst nightmare. If you have ever woken up screaming in the night, we are the people you were dreaming about. On a TV in front of me, they played a video showing their torture room and things they had done to others. I was so terrified I could hardly watch, but they were getting a kick out of showing it to me. They left me chained to the bed for three days. David went off to work as usual, and Cindy stayed to watch me. On the third day, David told me, We're going to the toy box. I want to show you my toys. The way he said toy box gave me the creeps. They took me to the other trailer, where David put me on a table and tied me down, hand and foot. Looking around, I could see things that looked like medical instruments, pliers, clamps, saws and scalpels. There were also whips and chains and padlocks and other scary-looking restraints. It looked like some kind of torture chamber that you see in the movies. The sight of all those things for pinching, twisting and cutting flesh paralyzed me with fear. David called those horrible instruments his friends. I realized I had to stay cool or never get out alive. If I tried to fight them, I was sure they'd kill me and dump my body. David had stripped me to the waist. Looking into his cold eyes was like seeing the devil himself. I was gagged and blindfolded. Suddenly I felt a terrible pain as they jammed something into me from behind. The pain paralyzed me. I prayed silently in my head. Dear God, please help me survive this. I don't want to die. I could hear David breathing heavily. and He and Cindy began inflicting as much pain on me as they could. Later they led me back to the bedroom, where I was again chained to the bed. The next day, David said to Cindy, I think Angie would like to pleasure me, wouldn't you, little girl? He then made me perform a sex act on him. They again took me back to the toy box and strapped me to the table, telling me I was going to have electrotherapy. David clipped wires to my breasts and lower body. Cindy watched as he switched on the power. It was like scorching fire surging through my body, and I thought I was dying, and I would never see my son or boyfriend again. Through my agony I could hear David and 
Cindy making moaning noises as they watched my torment, saying, Watch how she moves, and watch how the current hits her. I tried to scream, but gagging my mouth kept me from making a sound. The torture went on for at least an hour, but it felt like it would never end. I was shaking like a leaf when they brought me back to the bed and again chained me up like a dog. On the fifth day, Cindy Handy went out to do some shopping. Left alone, I began thinking about how practiced these two devils were at what they were doing. They had probably done this many times before, countless other women, and I knew I had to rely on my street smarts to survive. I figured to work on David Ray. While I was chained to the couch, naked and weeping, I said to him, David, come over here and sit by me. I'm feeling so down. Come hold me, please. Sitting next to me, David told me that he liked me and thought I was a nice person. He said, If I had known how nice you were beforehand, I wouldn't have started all this. Cindy didn't tell me you were so sweet. I think we could have been friends. I could hardly believe my plan was working. In a sincere tone, I told him it wasn't too late. We could still be friends, and I would never tell anybody about what he'd done. Somehow I convinced him to let me go. When Cindy came back, she wasn't happy about it. But Cindy was not the boss of that household, and after David told her off, she agreed with him. I promised to hitch a ride to Albuquerque, over one hundred miles away, and not come back. They took me in their car and dropped me off on I-25. On the 21st of February, 1999, Angelique Montano, wearing the same clothes she was wearing five days earlier, put out her thumb and tried to hitch a ride back to her home in truth or consequences. After a couple of hours and without much luck, she managed to flag down an off-duty sheriff from Los Lunas County. She told her whole story to the officer as he drove her back to her boyfriend and young son. He doubted she was telling the truth, and her account went unreported to the Sierra County Sheriff's Office. A month later, after the officer saw the unfolding David Parker Ray investigation on TV, he regretted his mistake, and if he had believed Angie's story, maybe lives could have been saved. Angie was very much correct in her assessment that David and his wife was practiced in their torture and kidnapping ways. As your humble host stated, Official believed David had been abducting, raping, torturing, and oftentimes killing young women since his return from Korea in 1963, and that's not including any victims he might have racked up while stationed overseas. It is not unheard of for U.S. servicemen to be accused of rape and sexual misconduct while serving abroad. And judging from David's ravenous sexual appetites and how Korean prostitutes were readily available to U.S. troops, it would not surprise me if he started honing his killing skills while in uniform. The problem facing law enforcement in the David Parker Ray case was bodies. As Angelique was a typical example of, David also often let his victims go, although rarely in as good shape as she was in. Usually, judging from his diaries and many notes, he kept his prisoners drugged and intoxicated 
to such a degree that they were unable to locate where they had been, what they had been subjected to, and who had done it. And at times he did kill, the desert is one of the most effective places to get rid of bodies. It is vast in size, and thus almost impossible to conduct any effective search in, unless you know where to look. Also, local carrion, offal eaters and wildlife will quickly devour any remains left out in the open, making identification impossible. Another problem was the way local police viewed most of David's victims. Often they were prostitutes or drug addicts, and the police placed little or no trust in what they said. However, in David Parker Ray's case, the FBI quickly got involved, and they are far more experienced in dealing with serial killers than local law enforcement. Right away, they located in David's trailer a videotape showing him playing doctor with a young naked woman strapped to the toy box's torture table with duct tape over both eyes and mouth. The only identifying mark was a swan tattoo on her ankle. They blew the image of the tattoo up and published it nationwide. It wasn't long until a woman from Arizona called the FBI and reported that her daughter had disappeared for three nights and days back in 1996. A man she now identified as David Parker Ray had showed up three days later at her home with her daughter, Kelly Van Cleve. He said he found her all messed up on a park bench, and he said, I thought I'd bring her home. She was dehydrated, and we stopped at Earl's Diamond gas station, and I bought her a cup of coffee. The young woman apparently had appeared much disoriented, and claimed she didn't remember anything of what had happened to her the last three days. Now, three years later, FBI officers sought out Kelly for a new interview. She was still a young woman, only twenty-five years, and she sat nervously as officers showed her photos from the video where David is torturing the girl with a swan tattoo. She confirmed the naked girl was her, and said she'd been having nightmares for years, and that memories slowly had begun to come back. The young woman told her story as follows. I was friends with Roy Yancey. He's a good friend of David Parker Ray. Roy used to tell me he was in a satanic group for years, and he said David Ray had always been the leader. I'd never met David, but I knew his daughter, Glenda Ray. We called her Jessie. I'd known her for three years, and I knew a lot of people in truth or consequences who got their drugs from her. She was a major league drug runner, coke, meth, grass, the whole bag. I'd never done drugs before, but I liked to hang out and party with Jesse, Roy and her friends. The night I got in trouble was July 25th, 1996. It was hotter than hell, so I went out bar hopping with a bunch of my friends and we ended up at the Blue Water Saloon. They drank all day but I only had one bear. I was the designated driver. Later that night, Jessie said she'd take me home. She drives a big motorcycle, and she's always letting people hitch a ride with her. She said she wanted to drink some coffee first, so we got on her big motorcycle, and instead of taking me home, she drove me over to her dad's trailer. Inside, I sat down on the couch while Jessie and her dad went into the back room. When they came out, one sat beside me and the other one knelt at my feet. I can't remember which one did what, but I do remember that one held a knife to my throat 
and the other used duct tape to cover my eyes and my mouth. At first I thought they were playing a joke on me. When I realized they were serious, I guess I kind of froze up, and I went along with them because I didn't want them to hurt me. They took off my clothes and took out a dog collar and put it around my neck. Then they took me out to the toy box. I still don't remember too much. I just remember being tied up, and I remember David poking me with a metal dildo, you know, right between the legs. I remember going to the bathroom twice in a little potty, and I know that David was the only other person in there with me. One time he got mad because I kept licking the tape around my mouth so it wouldn't stick. One time I pleaded with him saying I really wanted to go home. Another time he was using those huge rubber spike dildos on me and it hurt real bad. I told him, it hurts David, and he quit. Another time he was playing gynecologist and it really hurt, and he quit that time too. He told me his satanic group had been watching me for a long time because they wanted me as a sex slave. But he finally decided I was too tight between the legs for good sex, and eventually he let me go. End quote. By early April 1999, over 100 FBI and police agents were swarming all over the David Ray property at 513 Bass Road. Many of them were wearing white jumpsuits and masks and digging in the yard. Others wore surgical gear and focused on what they could find inside the trailer and the so-called toy box. Eleven days after he was arrested, David Parker Ray claimed another victim. Patty Rust, a law enforcement agent, killed herself after spending four days inside the toy box, making detailed drawings for the FBI. The toy box was literally a chamber of horrors. Inside were several macabre objects. A big white sign with red letters said in all capital letters, Satan's Den. Next to the sign was a smaller sign that simply said, The Bondage Room. Standing next to the Satan sign was a high-end video camcorder mounted on a tripod, pointed directly at a large black leather table rigged up with metal stirrups, electrodes, and dozens of red plastic straps. From the ceiling there was a RCA Victor television set, positioned so that female victims could see what Ray was doing to them. On the left side of the chamber was a coat hanger, with a black robe with a red cape. Next to the robe was a business-like clipboard, and it appeared Ray had documented victims he'd kidnapped between 1994 and 1997. The clipboard documented the number of victims and how many sexual assault sessions each had been subjected to. From February 7th to September the 23rd, 1997, David had kidnapped 17 nameless women. No one of the victims had suffered less than 27 rapes, and one that had been kidnapped in May of 1995 had endured 53 sexual assaults and torture over a period lasting from the 8th of May until, probably, the next kidnapping on June 10th. That equals 13 assaults per week, or an average of two per day. Next to the clipboards hung a variety of black and white photos and drawings of women, all being tortured. One of the photos showed a red-haired woman in obvious pain, her naked breasts were hogtied at the base with circles of constricting white rope, making them bulge. 
old-fashioned clothespins attached to each nipple. Above the photos and drawings hung another sign. This one stated, The Lure of Satanism. David had also put up instructions, both to remind himself and any helpers he might have around of what he thought the captured women would do in order to break free. I quote, Remember, a woman will do or say anything to get loose. They will kick, bite, scream, threaten, scratch, yell, run, lie, offer money, beg, offer sex, wait for opportunity, or offer any of the standard excuses and sob stories such as menstruation, pregnant, venereal disease, AIDS, sick, kids with babysitter, after work, a sick baby, a sick parent, claustrophobia, missed by husband or friend, bad heart, can't miss school. Remember, don't let her get to you. If she is worth taking, she is worth keeping, and she must be subjected to hypnosis before the woman can be safely released. Never trust a chained captive. The right side wall of the toy box was filled with David Parker Ray's tools. There are quite a lot of them, and I list them here. Chains, whips, paddles, pulleys, leather belts, saw blades, harnesses, handcuffs, ropes, wires, needles, pins, screw clamps, nipple clamps, breast clamps, breast suction cups, metal bras, sandpaper, metal dildos, wooden dildos, plastic dildos, latex dildos of all sizes, a branding iron, a soldering iron, and weighted lead sinkers, and an assortment of fishing hooks. Under the wall sat a large yellow generator. It had a handle on top and was attached to the back of a 15-inch flesh-colored motorized dildo pointing forward and designed to look exactly like a man's penis. The back of the generator had three switches, called buzzer, light, and probe. The apparatus looked like it could be picked up and used like some sort of jackhammer. The large gynecological leather table, filling most of the remaining room, was wired to a voltage meter, with wires that could be attached to a woman's breasts and genitalia. There was also a poster with some more instructions, this time on how to operate the electrical wires. I quote, 1. Operate motor with the lever in the up position. 2. Attach clamps securely to each nipple. 3. Tighten cord until breasts are stretched to the maximum length. 4. Turn machine on, and watch nipples for indication of tearing, and check clamps for slippage. Continue to operate. Note, this process is very painful, and due to the constant motion, the body will not adjust to the pain. During the operation, the subject will remain in extremely painful distress. End quote. Finally, at the back wall of the toy box was David's medicine cabinet. It was filled with hypodermic needles, latex gloves, forceps, rolls of cotton, lube, petroleum jelly, bottles of chloroform, ammonia, amphetamine pills, and a small collection of anatomy, witchcrafts, and sexually explicit books. Some of these titles included was Family Medical Guide, Emergency Victim Care, The Dark World of Witches, and American Psycho. Lead prosecutor in the David Parker Ray case, Jim Yance, has in later interviews told of how he, a few days after finishing with examining the Ray property, had to listen to the six audio tapes found inside Ray's mobile home. The audio tapes were part torture, 
part indoctrination meant for his newly captured victims. Especially one audio tape, apparently played for victims as soon as they woke up from being kidnapped, blindfolded and drugged, really got under the experienced officer's skin. I will now read you, dear listener, the transcript of this very tape. Now a small caution. The transcript is very graphic, and David has a tendency to repeat himself somewhat. But here it is, in its entirety. Hello there, bitch. Are you comfortable right now? I doubt it. Wrists and ankles chained, gagged, probably blindfolded. You are disoriented and scared too, I would imagine. Perfectly normal under the circumstances. For a little while, at least. You need to get your shit together and listen to this tape. It is very relevant to your situation. I am going to tell you, in detail, why you have been kidnapped, what is going to happen to you, and how long you'll be here. I don't know the details of your capture, because this tape is being created on July 23rd, 1993, as a general advisory tape for future female captives. The information I'm going to give you is based on my experience dealing with captives over a period of several years. If, at a future date, there are any major changes in our procedures, the tape will be upgraded. Now, you are obviously here against your will. Totally helpless. Don't know where you're at. Don't know what's going to happen to you. You're very scared or very pissed off. I'm sure that you have already tried to get your wrists and ankles loose. And I know you can't. Now you're just waiting to see what's going to happen next. You probably think you're going to be raped, and you're fucking sure right about that. Our primary interest is in what you've got between your legs. You'll be raped thoroughly and repeatedly in every hole you've got. Because basically you've been snatched and brought here for us to train and use as a sex slave. Sound kind of far out? Well, I suppose it is to the uninitiated, but we do it all the time. It's gonna take a lot of adjustment on your part, and you're not gonna like it a fucking bit. But I don't give a big rat's ass about that. It's not like you're gonna have any choice about the matter. You've been taken by force, and you're going to be kept and used by force. What all this amounts to is that you're gonna be kept naked and chained up like an animal, to be used and abused any time we want to, any way we want to, and you might as well start getting used to it, because you're gonna be kept here and used until such time as we get tired of fucking around with you. And we will, eventually, in a month or two, maybe three, it's no big deal, my lady friend and I have been keeping sex slaves for years. We both have kinky hang-ups involving rape, dungeon games, etc. We have found that it is extremely convenient to keep one or two female captives available constantly, to uh, satisfy our particular needs. We are very selective when we snatch a girl to use for these purposes. It goes without saying that you have a fine body, and you're probably young, maybe very young, because for our purposes we prefer to snatch girls in the early to mid-teens, sexually developed but uh, still small-bodied, scared shitless, easy to handle and easy to train, and they usually have tight little pussies and assholes. They make perfect slaves. Any time that we go on a hunting trip, if we can't find a little teenager, we usually start hitting the gay bars, look for well-built, big-titted lesbians. I thoroughly enjoy raping and screwing around with lesbians. There's not as much danger of them carrying a sexually transmitted disease. 
and I don't like using condoms. Also, even though they're a little older, unless they've been playing with dildos a lot, they still have tight holes between their legs, like the younger girls. If we can't find a lesbian that we want, we snatch anything that is young, clean and well built. We very seldom come back empty handed, cause there's plenty of bitches out there to choose from. And with a little practice in deception, most of them is very easy to get, with little risk. At this point it makes little difference what category you fall into. You're here, and we're gonna make the most of it. You're going to be kept in a hidden slave room. It's relatively soundproof, escape proof, and it's completely stocked with devices and equipment to satisfy our sexual fetishes and deviations. There may or may not be another girl in the room. Occasionally, for variety, we like to keep two slaves at the same time. In either case, as the new girl, you'll definitely be getting the most attention for a while. Now, as I said earlier, you're going to be kept like an animal. I guess I've been doing this too long. I've been raping bitches ever since I was old enough to jerk off and tie little girls' hands behind their back. As far as I'm concerned, you're a pretty piece of meat to be used and exploited. I don't give a flying fuck about your mind or how you feel about this situation. You may be married, have a kid or two, boyfriend, girlfriend, a job, car, payment, fuck it. I don't give a rat's ass about any of that. And I don't want to hear about it. It's something you're gonna have to deal with after you've turned loose. I make a point never to like a slave and I fucking sure don't have any respect for you. Yeah, your status is no more than that of one of the dogs. Or one of the animals out in the barn. Your only value to us is the fact that you have an attractive, usable body. And like the rest of our animals, you will be fed and watered, kept in good physical condition, kept reasonably clean, and allowed to use the toilet when necessary. In return, you're going to be used hard, especially during your first few days, while you're new and fresh. You're going to be kept chained in a variety of different positions, usually with your legs or knees forced wide apart. Your pussy and asshole is going to get a real workout, especially your asshole. Because I'm into animal sex. Also, both of those holes are going to be subjected to a lot of use with some rather large dildos, among other things. And it goes without saying that there's going to be a lot of oral sex. On numerous occasions, you're going to be forced to suck cock and eat pussy until your jaws ache and your tongue is sore. You may not like it, but you're fucking sure gonna do it. Now that's the easy part. Our fetishes and hang-ups include stringent bondage, dungeon games, a little sadism, nothing serious but uncomfortable and sometimes painful. Just a few little hang-ups that we like to use when we're getting off on a bitch. <laughs> if you're a young teeny bopper, and ignorant about fetishes and deviations, you're about to get an enlightening crash course in sex. Who knows, you may like some of it. It happens occasionally. If we want to take the time and trouble, even under these conditions, most bitches can be brought to orgasm. Now, I've already told you that you're gonna be kept here a month or two, maybe three, if you keep us turned on. If it's up to my lady, it would keep you indefinitely. She says it's just as much fun and less risky. But personally, I like variety. A fresh pussy now and then to play with. We take four or five different girls each year, depending on our urges and sometimes accidental encounters. 
Basically, I guess we're like predators. We're always looking. Occasionally, some sweet little thing. We'll be broke down on the side of the road, walking, bicycling, jogging. Anytime an opportunity like that presents itself, and it's not too risky, we'll grab her. Even if we've already got a captive in the playroom. Variety is definitely the spice of life. Now I'm sure that you're a great little piece of ass. And you're gonna be a lot of fun to play with. But I will get tired of you eventually. If I killed every bitch that we kidnapped, there'd be bodies strung all over the country. And besides, I don't like killing a girl. Unless it's absolutely necessary. So I've devised a safe alternative method of disposal. I had plenty of bitches to practice on over the years, so I've pretty well got it down to pet. And I enjoy doing it. I get off on mind games. After we get completely through with you, you're gonna be drugged up real heavy with a combination of sodium pentothal and phenobarbital. They are both hypnotic drugs that will make you extremely susceptible to hypnosis. Auto-hypnosis and hypnotic suggestion. You're gonna be kept drugged up a couple of days while I play with your mind. By the time I get through brainwashing you, you're not gonna remember a fucking thing about this little adventure. You won't remember this place, us, or what has happened to you. There won't be any DNA evidence, because you'll be bathed. Both holes between your legs will be thoroughly flushed out. You'll be dressed, sedated and turned loose on some country road, bruised, <laughs> sore all over, but nothing that won't heal up in a week or two. The thought of being brainwashed may not be appealing to you, but we've been doing it a long time and it works. And it's the lesser of two evils. I'm sure that you would prefer that, in lieu of being strangled or having your throat cut. Okay, undoubtedly somebody's gonna be looking for you. It may or may not be a missing persons report, but nobody's gonna be looking for you here. They don't have any idea where you're at. You don't even know where you're at. We're always very careful about that. There are not gonna be any knights in shining armor coming to rescue you. You are strictly on your own. And under the circumstances, I bet that is a scary thought. If there is another girl in the room, she won't be able to help you either. Because she's gonna be in the same position you're in. As for escaping, I'm sure you'll try to figure out a way. That's human nature. But it's not hardly even worth talking about here. It would not be prudent on our part to have you running around in the woods screaming rape. It would be an embarrassment, to say the least. Consequently, you are going to be kept in an environment that is even more secure than a prison cell. If it has not already been done, very shortly a steel collar is going to be padlocked around your neck. It has a long, heavy chain that is padlocked to a ring in the floor. The collar will never be removed until you are turned loose. It's a permanent fixture. The hidden toy box, where you're gonna be kept, has steel walls, floor and ceiling. It's virtually soundproof and has a steel door with two keyed locks. The hinges are welded on and there are two heavy deadbolts on the outside. The room is totally escape-proof, even with tools. Any time that you are left unattended in the room, your wrists will be chained, and there are electronic sensors to uh, let us know if you move around too much. If that's not enough, there is a closed-circuit TV system with a surveillance camera. It's wired to the main TV in the living room so we can check on you once in a while. Or just sit and watch you for the fun of it. Electronics is a wonderful thing. Expensive as hell. Everything in the room is expensive. 
and damn well worth it. If everybody knew how much fun it was to keep a sex slave, half the woman would be chained up in somebody's basement. Anyway, we have had a lot of practice at this, and uh, we're not real concerned about you escaping. You're fucking sure not gonna go anywhere. Now, if you're not already naked, you soon will be. Your clothing will be bagged up and saved until such time as we decide to turn you loose. As far as being naked goes, you might as well get used to it. For what you are going to be used for, clothing will just be in the way. Besides, I like watching a naked woman's body. All of it. Whether it be in a room or on the TV set. As I've already said, you'll be fed and watered on a regular basis. Not as much as you're used to, I'm sure, but enough to keep you healthy. You'll only be fed once a day, like the rest of the animals. And during the first few days, until you adjust to it and your stomach shrinks up, you're going to feel a little weak and you'll be hungry all the time. It won't take long, three or four days. And during the first few days... Until you adjust to the environment, I prefer to keep you in a weakened position anyway. Now, you already know that you have been kidnapped and brought here for us to train and use as a sex slave. I realize that being abducted and being forced into sexual slavery is a hard pill to swallow. Some girls really have a lot of trouble with it, and I'm sure that you will, to a certain extent also have. But face it, you can't get away. You can't say no. You're gonna be naked all the time. You won't be able to struggle or resist. You're going to have to lay there and take it, good or bad, no matter what is being done to you. A scary thought? Yes, but there are no options. Nothing that you can say or do will change the facts that is going to happen. Many girls beg and plead. Almost all of them cry a lot, especially during the first three or four days. And some of them scream and threaten. But I have a poster on the wall in the toy box that says it all. If they're worth taking, they're worth keeping. And I'm going to tell you, just so you know, since you are being kept here against your will, we will never trust anything you say, do or promise. You are a potential threat to us, and you will always be treated as such. On numerous occasions, bitches have told me that they'd do anything I wanted them to. If I'd just take the chains off, I've been offered ransom money, and I've even had girls tell me they liked it. But I like to use the chains. Money is not that important, and masochists are rare as hell. <laughs> I wonder what your scam's gonna be. Not anything that I haven't heard before, I bet. If you get a chance to talk at all. Well, let's change the subject a little bit. You already know that, for the most part, you're gonna be kept in the toy box. But once in a while, we like to take a captive into the bedroom. In chains, of course. Also, we have a couple of real close friends that we party with once in a while. They know about our hang-ups, and they don't have any problem with fucking a slave. You may be required to service them occasionally, but that's an easy one. For the most part, just fucking and sucking. They don't get into the heavier stuff. However, when we have a party, sometimes I like to put on a little show, as you won't like at all. You'll be taken into the living room and put on the floor, on your hands and knees, naked. Your wrists, ankles, knees and hips will be strapped to a metal frame to hold your body in that position. The frame is designed for doggy fucking... Your ass up in the air, sex organs exposed, your tits hanging down on each side of a metal support bar, knees spread about 12 inches, position similar to that of a bitch dog in heat, 
right in the middle of the floor so we can sit on the couch and in chairs and watch. I'm going to rub canine breeder's musk on your back, the back of your neck and on your sex organs. Now, I have three dogs. All of them's male, because I don't need any fucking pups. One of them is a very large German shepherd that's always horny, and he loves it when I bring him in the house to fuck a woman. After I let him in the house, he'll sniff around you a little bit, and within a minute, he'll be mounting you. There's about a 50-50 chance which hole he'll get his penis into, but it doesn't seem to bother him whether it's the pussy or the asshole. His penis is pretty thin, it goes in easy, but it's about 10 inches long, and when he gets completely excited, it gets a hell of a knot right in the middle of it. Now, if I've had slaves tell me that it feels like they got a baseball inside of them, it doesn't take long. He's gonna hump you real fast for about three or four minutes. And while he's doing it, he'll wrap his front legs around your chest to hold himself in position. And in the process, he'll probably scratch your tits up a little bit with his claws. After he gets through, he usually turns around and tries to pull out. No, uh, he'll jerk a little. Not much, mostly just steady pressure. And I've timed it. The knot will usually shrink up enough to come out of your pussy in about three minutes. If he's in your asshole, about five minutes. I don't use the dog all that often, but I don't deprive him of pussy either. There's no doubt that he's going to be on you a few times while you're here, because I like watching it. And any time it's just you, me and the dog, it will always be in your butt. The dog knot on his penis is big and extremely uncomfortable when he's uh, pushing it back and forth, way up in your anus. I really enjoy watching a girl wiggle, jerk and squirm around while he's doing it. Consequently, I give him a little uh, assistance getting it in the right hole. Now, if you think all of this stuff is sick and depraved, you haven't seen anything yet. This is a different world. Among our small circle of friends, little things like rape, kidnapping, doggy fucking, stuff like that, are everyday occurrences. Matter of course. Here, anything can happen, and often does. We like living in the mountains because it's quiet, secluded, private, and everybody minds their own business. The only close house belongs to our friends, and they don't hear or see anything. Okay, let's talk about uh, your training, the rules and punishment. Here you are a slave, and discipline is extremely strict. You're gonna be given a set of rules, things you can and cannot do and you will learn to comply, because each time you violate a rule, you will be punished. As soon as each rule is told to you, it will become law, as far as you are concerned, and you know what's gonna happen every time you fuck up. We'll use a couple of methods of punishment. A whip is an excellent training aid, so is an electroshock machine. Any time you get out of line, one or both will be used on your body, and I assure you, it's not going to be pleasant. There aren't many rules, and they're very easy to remember. But you're gonna make mistakes. Every slave does. I don't like repeat offenders. It gets me very upset. During the first few hours, the first time you violate a certain rule, a teaching process. The second time you violate the same rule, you'll be lightly punished. And the third time you violate it, it's gonna be full punishment. After the first day, we won't cut you any slack at all. We will expect total obedience. Now, let's start this off right. You are a slave. You don't realize it yet, but you will eventually. I'm your master and the lady is your mistress. You will be totally docile. 
You'll be very quiet, and you'll speak only when spoken to. Never initiate conversation. Keep your mouth shut. Any time that you are spoken to, you will be required to respond, and it will be with proper speech. Remember that we are in the dungeon game, and as long as you are here, it's the only game in town. Any time that you are asked a question where a yes or a no answer is required, you will respond by saying, Yes, master, no, mistress, no, master etc. You will show proper respect. Having to use the word master or mistress may sound funny, petty or vain to you, but that's all right. If you choose not to do it, you can laugh while you're being whipped or when your body is convulsing under the electroshock machine. You will respond to commands without protest or resistance. Do exactly what you're told, nothing else. Remember that here you are a slave. Failure to respond to a command will definitely get you in trouble. If I decide to rape you in your pussy or in your asshole, don't resist or struggle. When I tell you to spread your legs or to pull them back, you say, yes, master, and obey the command, because to do anything less will get you beaten. If I tell you I want to be sucked off, you say yes, master, and open your mouth. I love oral sex, if it's done right. You're going to be taught exactly the way I like it. How to use your lips and tongue. We'll be practicing a lot, and each time when I get ready to come, I'm going to push my penis down your throat and keep it there until I get through squirting. I'm not going to choke you. But you need to learn to hold your breath and to swallow every bit of the sperm. If I see one drop leaking out of your mouth, I'm gonna punish you. Basically, it's gonna be the same with your mistress. If she demands oral sex, you say yes, mistress, and respond. She also will teach you exactly the way she likes it. And you will keep using your tongue on her pussy until she gets off. Now, I can't... Foresee what kind of bitch you're gonna be. How you feel about oral sex or any of that shit. But I am gonna tell you this. If, during oral sex or any other time, you should bite one of us, I'm going to cut you a little bit. I'll cut your nipple off, for a starter. And if it's a bad bite, I'll cut your tit off too. That may sound harsh, but your teeth are serious weapons, and we are not gonna tolerate any shit from you. I have been bitten, and I've cut off nipples. So don't fuck around. That's enough said about that. Remember the commands. Yes, master, no, mistress. If your mistress should come into the room and tells you to get down on the floor and lay down on the floor, you say, yes, mistress and then lay down on the floor, exactly the way she told you to. If she tells you to pull your knees up, you say yes, mistress, and pull your knees up. If she tells you to spread your knees, you say yes, mistress, and spread them wide apart, and hold them there so she can play with your pussy. Use dildos or whatever. A slave must always obey every command and offer no resistance. Remember that. Never say no unless it's justified, like in response to a question. If either one or both of us decide to put you in a different bondage position, the chains will be taken off the various parts of your body, wrists and ankles. Never off of your neck. Don't kick, struggle, or resist in any way. If you do, you're going to be in a world of hurt. If you're told to hold your leg out so a chain can be attached to your ankle, you say, yes, master, or yes, mistress, and hold your leg out. For repeated rule violations, the punishments are eventually going to become harsh and even brutal. 
and you won't have anyone to blame but yourself. Now, I should also tell you that there's gonna be times when the whip and the electroshock is not used for punishment, but for our pleasure. The difference will be that when it's done for pleasure, the whip strokes will be much lighter. They'll sting like hell, but they won't have that burning sensation and leave welts that hurt for hours. As for the electroshock machine, the voltage will be turned down. It won't be that harsh electricity that, uh, make your body convulse and jerk all over the table. You haven't experienced any of that yet, but I'm sure that you will. To avoid these punishments, you're going to have to be very quiet, very docile and very obedient, and I imagine that's gonna be very hard for you to do. You'll probably try us a few times, to see if this is real. <laughs> Most captives do. If you want to, be my guest, because it's all part of the game. Now well, let's discuss talking. You cannot talk, you cannot speak, unless you have been given permission. I believe that rule gets more bitches in trouble than anything else, because they can't keep their damn mouths shut. They always want to whine, beg, plead, try to talk me into turning him loose. I used to listen to it. I don't anymore. I enjoy blessed silence. Around here, your mouth is for sucking, not talking. Around here, the only time I ever want to hear you initiate speech is if you have to use the restroom and you will learn to do it properly. Master, may I please use the restroom? Or, Mistress, may I please use the restroom? In response, we will ask you what you need to do. If you have to pee, you say, Pee, Master, or Pee, Mistress. If you have to crap, you say, Crap, Master, or Crap, Mistress. It will be done that way because, quite often, you will be in heavy restraints. A lot of straps on your body, chains on your wrists and ankles, a bunch of stuff that's, uh, time-consuming and hard to get loose. If you have to pee, we'll use a bedpan. If you have to shit, you may have to hold it a while. Whatever the case, we need to know. And you definitely need to tell us. Because if you make a mess, you're going to be punished, and you will have to clean it up. Now, I've covered the basics pretty thoroughly. You know to keep your mouth shut and not try to talk. You know the proper way to say master or mistress, and you know how you're expected to act and respond to commands. If you can learn, there will not be a great deal of punishment. We'll get along pretty good. Remember that each time you fuck up, you are gonna be punished. And after it's happened a few times, you're really gonna dread it. As long as you have chains on your body, don't try either one of us. It is an extremely dangerous thing to do because, if necessary, I'm capable of doing things to your body and torturing you in ways that you can't even imagine. The toy box is equipped with a full set of surgical instruments, which I have had occasion to use and will again, as necessary. I've already told you what will happen if you bite. To be completely safe here, you will have to be docile. If you should accidentally or otherwise hurt, scratch or kick either one of us, you could be in very serious trouble. I'm sure that you want to survive this experience, and I want you to also. But you are expendable and it's no big deal to go out and snatch a replacement. May sound harsh and cold, but if you give us too much trouble, or if you pose any kind of threat to us, I won't have any qualms about slicing your throat. Like I said before, I don't like killing the girls that we bring here, but occasionally things happen. What can I say? I would really hate to have to dump that pretty little body off in a canyon somewhere to rot. I'm not trying to scare you, that's just the way it is. Now later, I'm going to be asking you a bunch of questions. Since I'm going to be caring for your body for the next month or two or three, 
There are certain things that I need to know. I've prepared a questionnaire that I fill out with each new captive. Some of the questions are going to be embarrassing, but you should answer them truthfully and completely. You damn well better. I don't want to catch you in a lie. The questions will be in reference to your physical condition, any medical conditions that I need to know about, medications, sex habits, sexual preferences, any childbirths you might have had, period dates and so forth. Now your training has already started. Each time I ask you one of those questions on the questionnaire, there's going to be a proper way to answer it, which I'll tell you about in a few minutes. While we go through the questionnaire, you're going to be strapped down on the gynecology table. Your feet will be in stirrups, and your knees will be pulled wide apart with everything exposed. I like to keep a girl that way while she's answering the questions, so I can examine and verify uh, anything she might tell me which would affect her use as a sex slave. If you do have any kind of medical condition, by all means, let me know. We'll discuss it, and we may make adjustments. We won't turn you loose, but we may make adjustments. We're probably going to be starting on this questionnaire pretty soon. You'll be naked, and as I said, you'll be strapped down on a gynecology table, so you can't wiggle or squirm around. You will be talking quite a bit, answering the questions. So I'm sure that we'll start your speech training at the same time. Consequently, before we start on the questionnaire, two small electrical clamps will be put on your nipples. Each time a question is asked, you will respond properly. For instance, if I ask you how old you are, you will respond by saying, Master, I'm 19 years old. Answer the question completely and say nothing else. If the question requires a yes or no answer, say yes master or no master. If I ask you your period dates, you say master my period is so and so. If I ask you about childbirth, you say no master or master I had a baby a year ago or whatever. Always start each sentence by saying master and take your time we're not going to be in any hurry. Think about what you're going to say before you say it. Because each time you fuck up, I'm going to press a little button and send a few thousand volts of electricity through your nipples right down into your tits. You are in training. So it will just be a quick blast. I'm not going to hold it down and torture you. But each time you screw up, it's going to be a little worse. Take your time, answer the questions properly. I'm not going to push you. We're not going to be in any hurry. Think about each thing you're going to say and be damn sure and start your sentence with master. If you get through that okay, get your speech down pat, keep your mouth shut and don't give us any trouble, then the first day is going to be real pleasant for everybody. I'm gonna put some dildos in those holes between your legs, but they will not be big ones. Basically, I just wanna become very familiar with your sex organs and the size of the holes. All girls are different. During the course of the day, you're gonna be raped several times, but that's no big deal. The second day, after you get totally familiar with the rules and procedures, we're gonna get down to the nitty-gritty. A lot of it will not be very pleasant for you, but you might as well get used to it because it's gonna be like that for a while. Eventually things will settle down a little. Then just take it day by day. Well, I believe I've told you about everything that I can. I cannot predict the future. I can't predict changes of procedure. But if this tape is being played for you... I have to assume that it's still reasonably accurate. And I can only give you advice. Be smart and be a survivor. Don't ever scream. Don't talk without permission. Be very quiet. Be docile and obedient. And by all means, 
Show proper respect. Have a nice day. End quote. Unfortunately, David Parker Ray never revealed how many he actually killed, and so the final number can only be guessed at. But during his and his accomplices' trial, several victims were specified. Ray's lover, Hendy, claims Ray killed a business partner called Billy Bowers. He was killed, dismembered post-mortem, and Ray disposed of his body parts in a lake. A 22-year-old woman called Marie B. Parker was tortured for days by Ray before he had one of his accomplices. This time a young man named Yancey strangled her to death. Also, a 22-year-old woman called Jill Suzanne Troya was last seen at a Frontier restaurant in 1995 with David Parker Ray and his daughter Jessie. She was never seen nor heard from again. The reason investigators think he has killed as many as 60 people is that Ray kept a diary with details on where and when he kidnapped his victims and he alludes to killing over 40 in the diary alone. Unfortunately, he left out details of what happened to them after their time in the toy box. When he died, he took that knowledge to his grave with him, leaving investigators with a lot of questions. We're convinced that there are remains, said Rich Libitzer, who handled the case for New Mexico State Police. It's just a matter of locating them. Libiser, now retired and teaching at New Mexico State, still believes at least some of the bodies were dumped in Elephant Butte Lake. I quote, David was very familiar with that lake, and he worked as a mechanic for the state parks, Libiser said. He also made comments in the past that we know about, about the best way to dispose of a human body in a body of water such as Elephant Butte Lake. Investigators have searched the lake over the years, with a major push in 2011. Lower water levels allowed New Mexico State Police to uncover bone fragments from a human leg, but the medical investigator was unable to retrieve any DNA to find out whose leg it was. Even with less water in the lake, Libiser says Ray may have taken extra steps to ensure evidence of his crimes would never be found. I quote, Poke holes in their lungs with an ice pick. Fill their intestinal cavity with rocks or some kind of weight. Wrap them in tarp cover them with chicken wire or barbed wire, weight them down with cinder blocks or other heavy weights, and sink them in the deepest part of the lake. End quote. Although Ray is suspected in dozens of murders, he only pleaded guilty to the kidnapping and sexual torture of three victims. On Thursday, the 20th of September, 2001, Judge Sweezy gave David Parker Ray the maximum sentence for that, 224 years in prison. As part of the deal engineered by the prosecutor and the defense attorney, Sweezy gave David's daughter Jessie Ray only nine years and suspended six and a half, setting her free after serving only two and a half years behind bars for helping her father kidnap, rape, torture, and murder several women. David Parker Ray suffered a fatal heart attack in his cell at the Hobbs New Mexico Correctional Facility on the 28th of May 2002. He was 62 years old. I have been your host, Thomas Vyborg Thun. Doing this podcast is a labor of love. But if you do want to support me, it is greatly appreciated. I have created a Patreon account that you can find at patreon.com slash the Serial Killer Podcast. And any donation, no matter how small, helps a great deal. 
Patrons have started letting themselves be known. Maud, Wendy, Justin, Linda and Patty, thank you. Your patronage is very much appreciated and your donations duly noted. Finally, as always, if you enjoy this podcast, please subscribe to it and feel free to leave a review on iTunes or your favorite podcast review site. Thank you, dear listener, for listening and join me next time for another tale of serial murder. Good night and good luck.